I want you to imagine for a second that you are among the last few survivors on Earth and are challenged with a frostbound climate, a deadly virus and a barbaric group of cannibals all at the very same time. In today's story, we follow the journey of the people in Colony 7, look at the threats they face, what they did wrong and how we can survive and beat the cannibals in the Colony 2013. Let's go! <laughs> Now before we start the video, I have something very nice to share. So I have looked for a new browser a few months ago and I stumbled over Oprah, a browser which is basically a multitasking hub um, that really speeds things up and makes things much more efficiently. A few days ago, they have reached out to me for a collaboration to which I instantly agreed because I do think this is a really great product. Personally, I use WhatsApp a lot, so this direct integration really speeds things up because I just hate switching between my phone and my laptop all the time, so this is really uh, much appreciated. If you're more on Instagram or Facebook Messenger, then of course, this works just as well. Another feature that I think is pretty cool is the integration of music apps like YouTube Music or Spotify, which allows you to play music directly from your browser without opening another tab. Because we all know we don't like tabs, right? If you run a side hustle or are a student, the flow function might be interesting as well. This basically lets you share documents between all your devices using Opera, which is just a nice solution to have everything in place once again. If you have a quick document to share or a meme or a screenshot and you don't want to send an email or you don't want to use AirDrop or whatever, you can just drop it in your browser and you have it available on your phone instantly. It's pretty nice. On another note, you also get an easy access VPN, an ad blocker and a pin board where you can gather all sorts of things and share the whole pin board with other people. Selected people can add to your pin board and even leave comments. Say you're planning a trip with a group of friends or you're looking for references with your team, this function comes in super handy. The browser is completely free, you can download it via the link in the pinned comment. Let me know what you think and of course, thank you to Oprah for sponsoring this video and collaborating with us. It is the year 2045 and Earth's surface is an unlivable pile of snow. Whatever has remained of humanity has been banished to live underground. Colony 7 is one of the last few standing shelters and if that wasn't enough, decades of isolation and limited contact with diseases made people's immune systems so weak it is embarrassing. Just an outbreak of the common cold is a huge threat to the survival of the group. Therefore, the colonists have set rigid rules for it. If you are sick, you go into quarantine and if you don't recover, you are given one choice. Either be killed by a gunshot or take a walk above ground until you freeze to death. Now this choice, even though it looks like a barbaric rule, serves the complete opposite. It allows for human compassion to stay alive in this godforsaken world. I mean, look, imagine every person who can't recover from just a cold is being shot dead. This would turn the shooters into cold-blooded monsters over time and the rest of the group into fearful animals. And there is nothing more dangerous than animals living in fear. But it also allows for a dignified way to go. It lets one decide over his or her death instead of being judged by someone else. Now, in the beginning of this movie, we see a person called Mason assigned to take care of an infected old man who is beyond recovery. The old man begs for another day to live, but Mason is fed up with begging. The man wants to take the walk to die naturally, but he, Mason, against the rules, doesn't grant him that wish. At this point, Sam, another survivor, insists that Mason lets the guy walk, but he pulls the trigger anyway. This results in a conflict, but is eventually brushed off because the man was about to die anyway. However, there are two major mistakes that are being committed by Mason. Firstly, it disturbs the peace of the group and the trust of the people in each other, which is vital to survive. And secondly, he is wasting a bullet on a man that was bound to die anyway. With no gun shops in every corner in America left, bullets are a vital asset and shouldn't be used unnecessarily. Now inside this colony, it seems like the people have been reading their survival guides pretty well or they've been watching Binge Express, I'm not sure. Look, they have survived for decades, therefore they must have been doing something right, right? Now I want to mention real quick, this is important to know. This colony is very well organized. They have assigned roles for everyone, they have a wide range of tasks to take off, they have livestock, a functioning satellite, communication devices and even a seed bank. It is quite remarkable. Alright, so back in the bunker, Sam goes to Briggs, who is the leader, and tells him about Mason's incident, but an emergency signal from a neighboring colony has Briggs' mind completely occupied. Knowing that Colony 5 can be in danger, they try to contact them but hear nothing back. 
This is a red flag that needs to be investigated. Whatever happened to Colony 5, it may well happen to us as well. Now, Briggs announces a meeting in the main hall to update everyone on what is happening. He meets Mason beforehand, confronts him about the man that he shot earlier, and it becomes very clear that there is a negative tension between them. We will look at this over the course of this video. Now, in a general meeting, Briggs breaks down the news about the neighboring colony to everyone present. He suggests assembling a team of three to visit Colony 5 and figure out what has happened. Now, everyone is clearly distraught, and although scared of the flu inside the colony, they would rather stay in than be on the exploration team above, which says a lot about the environment above ground. On top of that, Mason openly disagrees with Briggs, claiming that whatever the problem is in Colony 5, they shouldn't intervene because they have enough on their plate already. Which is true, but short-term thinking. Look, if there are only a few colonies left with a few dozen human beings in total, collaboration is key. You see, modern civilization was not established by isolation, but by opening up and collaborating with different cultures, their knowledge and resources. You see, Mason is a very dangerous person. Not only does he stir up frustration in all others, but he also disobeys the rules everyone else obeys to. This is a fundamental problem that should not go unnoticed under anyone's watch. People like this must be taken care of before they spiral out of control. Now, the mistake Briggs makes is that he himself will leave as part of the three man group to Colony 5. Now, this is very bad for two reasons, really. Firstly, the captain never leaves the ship. And secondly, leaving back in an aggressive and unpredictable person like Mason is simply a bad idea. Now Sam and a teenager called Graydon, who has not much surface experience yet, volunteer and the three-man team is ready. Personally, I would send Mason instead, even if that meant that I would need to join, because leaving him behind and leaving the colony as the captain are both equally bad prospects. And since Mason is unlikely to do what he is told, there would be no other choice than for me to go as well. Briggs announces the rules for while he is away and puts Kai in charge instead of Mason, who gets even more furious now for being ditched. Now, I think this was a strategic mistake Briggs made, but um, anyway, let's forget about this for now. Just before everyone is dismissed, a lady sneezes, which of course freaks everyone out. She and her husband are put into quarantine immediately, and everybody else uh, pulls up their masks. Now, first of all, with the virus being a serious threat to this colony, arranging a meeting like this is a stupid idea to begin with, no? Instead, Briggs should have just announced the news over the intercom system, which is available everywhere. From what we have seen, this virus is airborne, and the fact that everyone swiftly pulls up their masks when someone sneezes is pretty worthless since we all know that droplets escape our mouths even when speaking. Meaning if they don't always wear masks, which they should do in their case, their chance of surviving is zero over the course of a few years or even decades. So this movie logic does not make any sense, as we all know after COVID. Anyway, the trio sets out to Colony 5 and navigates through tough terrain, overcomes nearly collapsing bridges and even dysfunctional weather modification towers. Now the trio spends the night in a broken helicopter to relax, nibble on some snacks and chat a little. The next morning, they pack their stuff again and continue their journey to Colony 5. Now, this journey didn't take more than 24 hours and they were managing quite well. I find it a bit strange how easy the journey went versus how dangerous everybody thought this surface is. When they arrive, they come across a fresh trail of blood leading into the entrance of the colony, which of course is a huge red flag, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't noticed, a virus does not leave a trail of blood. Okay, this is the point of no return. If you enter, which of course you should not do, considering at least the size of your team, you will die. Meaning I would personally turn around, rest at the helicopter one more time, perhaps even scavenge the surrounding of this place and see if I can find more hints of what has happened and eventually come back with a larger team. For someone as seasoned in combat as Briggs, this should be a clear sign to get the hell out of here. But Briggs, again, proceeds with the mission instead of choosing the logical thing to do, which really does not make any sense no matter how you look at it. And when they make their way to the bottom, they find even fresher blood splashed all over the floor. Whatever the heck that was, it looks like it was hungry and hasn't much experience in western table manners. 
Bright liquid blood is obvious evidence that the killing spree wasn't over too long ago. Blood dries very quickly, as quick as just a few minutes with the right conditions. In our case here though, the weather is extremely cold, which can prolong the process to up to a few hours. But regardless, in our case here, this is still a very significant red flag that should never be overlooked. They eventually hear knocking on one of the doors they pass and make their way to it. Sam pickpockets the lock and they open the door to find a helpless man passed out on the ground. When the man realizes that they are in, he panics and screams, begging for help. Our characters lock the door and attend to his needs. Now this man is a huge asset, right? I would make sure that he tells me everything that he knows before I offer him any sort of aid. Not only does he know exactly what has happened, but he also know when and how, leading to multiple cornerstones that will help us to survive and help us escape in the best possible way. The man explains that when they operated a long-reaching communication device a few weeks ago, they received news of one of the weather modification towers that has been successfully activated and the weather altered in a limited area of a few square miles. Their colony sent a team to investigate, but instead of finding the actual source of the signal, they were found on the way back by them. Well, the man is very vague who those people were and what has happened to his colony, which is a real pain in the ass and the reason why you don't just offer food and water to someone who has not yet proven to be supportive. At least, however, he points at the geographic location of the source of the signal on a map which will help our characters later on in the story. Now, the group decides to grab whatever supplies they can and leave the colony ASAP. But before they can do so, the old man begs them to let him stay inside. What would he do in this situation? I mean, this man wants to stay behind, right? Why would you not leave him just be? It's his decision, but our trio almost forces him to join them, which is just ridiculous and stupid. And sure enough, once they step outside, they pay the price with the old man shutting the door in the loudest way possible, which was the least thing you would want to happen. Now, instead of just leaving this place, they hear a noise from the end of the corridor. And of course, what do you do in this moment? Absolutely, you go check it out because you want to know who has killed 50 plus people in the last five days with your team of three people. No, you don't. You just, <laughs> you just don't do that. They get to a giant hall where they hear loud chopping noises straight from the Dead Space universe or Silent Hill. And we all know what this means. It's time to leave. But it's been time to leave many, many times in the last few scenes. So... Like children, our characters can't help but stumble into the open field. It doesn't take a minute until they are spotted and all hell breaks loose. In the chaos, Graydon panics and runs off alone, which is of course the worst thing you could possibly do. But the mistake that he makes though is that he doesn't even run back to the exit. Instead, he runs into a different direction that he knows nothing about. This gets him ambushed and well, eaten alive by the cannibals that catch him. The trio should have kept in mind the fact that this group of cannibals has been down here for over one week. They know the ins and outs of this place, so a chase is nothing you can win. Firstly, you don't go look for a group of savages that have killed dozens of people in the past few days with just a group of three people. You just don't do that. You can't beat them, so why bother, right? Second, fighting these savages in their territory only adds to the nonsense our three guys engage in. And third, Graydon, what the fuck? Now, Bricks and Sam manage to run away more efficiently and knock the ladder off the exit before any beasts can follow up. The thing that I would have done differently, though, is I would have taken the time to hatch out the leader instead, because, like any other group, once the leader is out, the whole collective is weakened. Now, both climb up the last ladder, and after narrowly escaping death several times, Briggs uses one of the dynamite sticks he found earlier to destroy the entrance tower, hoping that this would trap the cannibals and let them escape for good. Now, I gotta give it to him, this is a stack of dynamite used very well. And even if it isn't enough to stop the cannibals, it is definitely enough so you can gain some distance. Now, on their way back, though, they do something not so intelligent because they decide to spend the night in the same helicopter like the day before. This is a bad idea for multiple reasons, of course. If those cannibals can escape Colony 5, which we have to assume, really, we are dead if we stay here. They should have pushed through as far as possible instead and tried to make it back in one go. The chance to survive a trek through a blizzard seems to be more comfortable than facing off 30 cannibals with axes and baby teeth. Don't you agree? I think you do. Anyway, 
And sure enough, the next morning they wake up and realize the cannibals have followed their footsteps through the snow and are closing in on them. With very little to do, they pack their things ASAP, head to the bridge, which really is the only chance for now. Considering the blizzard from yesterday night though, I would not have thought that anyone could see any sort of footsteps in the snow after hours have passed. So we can't blame the characters, but it was still a careless mistake. At the bridge, Briggs lights another dynamite pack on fire to break the bridge before the cannibals can cross it. The dumb mistake that he makes though is that he leaves the dynamite stack in the open air, which causes the fuse to go out. For a man that has complained about the strong wind just a few minutes and hours ago, this was a pretty stupid move, not gonna lie. He should have burned the fuse, hide the dynamite back in his backpack and placed it back at the same spot and voila, there you go. This would have done the job without the need for him sacrificing himself to save Sam and well Colony 7 because, well, that's exactly what he needs to do now. Sam starts running back to the colony, but makes the same mistake as they just did. He is leaving a trace behind him. Now he has clearly done enough surface time to know the surrounding better and should be able to pick a better route. If I were him, I would make my way through these buildings here as much as possible to make it difficult for anyone to follow me. Not only would this cause confusion and make them think that I might be hiding inside these buildings, but it also helps avoiding any footprints that I would inevitably leave in the snowy area. Now, Meanwhile, back at the colony, Mason takes a sick couple from the beginning out of their quarantine to execute them before even carrying out a test. He manages to kill the woman before Kai is able to intervene. The tension is at an all-time high, and because the tension is not yet high enough, Sam arrives with his own share of problems on his back. It doesn't take a minute though until Kai and he himself are knocked out. The next morning, he wakes up surrounded by everyone wanting to know what happened to the others. But just before he can say anything, Mason comes back and cuffs him to the bed. It becomes clear that he took the power while Briggs was gone, something we knew would happen if nobody did anything against it, which of course nobody did. Now, instead of telling everyone about all the horrific things he experienced, which he definitely should do, especially the 40-something cannibals that are out there seeking vengeance on him and everybody in here, he, for some unexplainable reason, talks to Mason instead, who does not even take him serious. Now look, first of all, Mason is a power-hungry egomaniac who has just hit your girlfriend unconscious. Why the hell would you ask him for his opinion on a matter you know will kill anyone around here? This is nuts. Sam would do well to work on his assertiveness instead. His pathetic approach to establish security by trying to convince a person like Mason was the worst possible route he could have picked. I would have shouted about the cannibals looking for us this very moment and that anything else but relentless cooperation among ourselves will lead to a gruesome death for everyone. Knowing that he effed up though, Sam picks the next best option, <laughs> escaping with those that want to. He receives the key to his cuffs from a little kid who stole it from Mason and frees himself. He then visits Kai and together with her satellite device, they pinpoint the location where the weather modification tower has successfully altered the terrain. This is the goal of their upcoming escape, if they make it, that is. They grab as many seed boxes as they can and prepare to run away, but they are stopped by Mason and his gang. Now, Once again, Sam chooses to challenge Mason instead of convincing him to leave by showing him the active location. Mason threatens to kill him with his gun, but their encounter is interrupted once the cannibals arrive. You know, I have recently read about an interesting approach to define stupidity. It was basically an essay written by a philosopher that goes by the name of Carlo Cipolla. It is not entirely clear whether he was serious with what he wrote, but it's interesting nonetheless. It fits this story pretty well. Um, basically, according to his theory, stupid people can't help but act in a way that will cause others to lose while losing themselves. Pretty much just like Mason acts in this movie. I may have mentioned this in a previous script, I don't really remember, but I think it still makes for a fun analysis for this, uh, for this character. Now they run to the security room and find out that the cannibals have already arrived. Mason, knowing that he was an idiot, suddenly turns around and suddenly starts giving orders. The beasts are pretty smart and use the air vents to attack. 
Now, it seems like there is nothing to do here, right? But in fact, there is a very smart strategy that should follow. These barbarians don't have any firearms. If the group keeps their distance and fires at them from afar while standing against a wall or something, they would easily win this fight. Also, they clearly have the upper hand when it comes to navigation because now they have a home play advantage. They make it to the vault, and while Sam and Kai are just about to arrive, Mason, fearing for his own life, surprise, surprise, doesn't let them in. But luckily, one of the colonists knocks Mason down and opens the door for the couple. One of the cannibals makes it in with them, but is no threat to the combined effort of the people. Now Sam quickly opens one of the vents and urges all the survivors to escape, but Mason tells them not to go. Now in good faith, Sam passes the gun to Mason before leaving, who then tries to kill him, but he realizes that he would need every last bullet to survive the upcoming challenge, and changes his mind. Shooting at the gas canister, he is able to kill most of the cannibals, which was somewhat a heroic thing to do. However, the boss survives by jumping into the vent and starts fighting Sam there. Remember the chance they had to kill the boss way back in the other colony? If they had actually done it, none of this would have happened. And if they were together back in the vault, it's dead certain that they would have won this fight, even if that meant taking their time. Anyway, Sam eventually wins the fight and is able to catch up with the other escapists. Well, what do you think they did wrong and what would you do differently? Let me know in the comments. As always, I'm very curious to hear your beats. With that said, thank you so much for watching. It is a big pleasure to be here as always. With that said, you know what? I'll see you again soon. Peace out, take care, and binge another one.